<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome. So I am recording now on YouTube for class. This is plant propagation. Sorry, not plant propagation. That was the class I just did. This is for <laughs> horticulture for my Magnolia students. Sorry about that. All right. Today we're going to do the um, talk about plant breeding. We talked a little bit about that on Wednesday. We're going to continue. You would probably want to open the plant breeding PowerPoint in your module in YouTube. I posted that a little bit a while ago. So this I'm doing this now at about 1130 AM today on Friday. So you should be able to open that. I'm not going to follow it exactly, but you can kind of, I'll have it open and going and I will be talking about the slides and then also extra things um, addition to that. After this, uh, probably around like one o'clock or so, two o'clock, I will post the video questions. So you'll hear me reference video questions. Look at this video, look at that video to see different things and to respond to questions. So that assignment will drop right after I post this. So you'll see that uh, shortly and that will be due next week. So you have some time to do that because you have to watch four videos. Um, I recommend you do that, though, before Monday. So this weekend, go ahead and watch those videos. Don't procrastinate. Because on Monday, I'm going to talk about those videos. <clears throat> They're all pretty short. Um, and they are to the point. So it, it's not a lot. But you, you do need to watch them. Or else when we start talking about things, you'll be a little behind. So it's kind of fun. So again, go ahead and get the PowerPoint open under plant breeding. And we're going to start. I'm going to open my PowerPoint as well. Okay, let's get started. So we talked about natural selection last week and how in nature she decides who's the winner by basically who has the offspring, whose genes get um, passed on to the next. So that's called natural selection. That process of natural selection is basically um, who survives and who doesn't. Now, nature and in the wild processes, and in, in the in the wild and in nature, there needs to be genetic variation. So that means there needs to be different uh, genes as much as possible in the population of any one organism. And the reason for this demand for genetic variation and diversity is a survival question. If you only have one set of genes designed or adapted for one growing condition or one environmental condition, that puts you at a vulnerability because if that condition stops or changes, you might have a hard time and go extinct. We see a lot of this. Habitat destruction or just climate change or just anything, change in general, the more diversity there is in the gene pool, the more likely there will be individuals who can survive it. Think of the pandemic. Some people got real sick died, unfortunately. Some people didn't. It has other factors, but similar type of thing. We need that diversity, right? Diversity is going to give us resilience to diseases, for one, and plants. Let's talk about plants. So definitely disease resilience. And two, it's going to give us new forms, remember new shapes of leaves, new colors, new strategies that, that might make the plant uh, have an advantage and actually evolve and become more adapted to those conditions. So that's kind of interesting. So on the first slide in your PowerPoint, you have the butterfly slide. That butterfly slide is the 
is titled Genetic Variation. And that's the diversity. You see all the different butterflies there on the side of the picture. They have different patterns, different colors. Think about all the different types of dogs. Again, remember we talked about dogs before. All the different types of birds. Chickens, they come in different colors. There's reasons for that. Right? These color variations, these patterns, this variation um, is a good thing. We need them. Sometimes variation goes unnoticed for a long time in, in animals and plants, but then all of a sudden something new happens or a new condition or we grow that plant in a new area. And then we start to learn how genes are expressed. Like, oh, that plant doesn't like it in a hotter climate because it becomes more disease prone. In which case you want to look for variation. You want to look for individuals that are found growing in warm, warmer areas that are doing fine. Maybe those individuals have some sort of genetic adaptation that they randomly inherited that makes them more adaptable to that condition. That's kind of what we're talking about. So again, that flexibility to change. So we're going to go to that moth on slide three, talk about the moths. And we mentioned this too last week. So imagine you're in a forest and the tree trunks are black. You're a moth that lives on tree trunks. So you have genes for various colors, right? And you, if you're not black, you're going to stand out. You live on these tree trunks that are dark colored. You're going to stand out. And unfortunately, you're edible to birds and everything. They're going to eat you. So it's not the best. Likewise, in a forest where the tree trunks are, let's say, birch trees, birch trees have very uh, pale, almost white trunks. And if you're a moth and you live on those trunks, you're not going to be dark colored. You're going to be white to blend in. And again, that's created by the environment. The light colored moths in the dark trunk forest are visible. They get eaten. Their genes do not get transferred in the future. Only those individuals with the dark wings. And likewise, in the forest with the birch, with the white trunks, the moths with the white wings will survive and the ones with the dark ones will not. And those light colored moth genes will perpetuate. Okay, so that's natural selection. And that's what this diversity is giving us. We don't have that diversity in the gene pool to begin with. The moths can't, you know, we, we're in trouble. We have some issues. Let's talk about that. Before I go to genotype and phenotype on the next slide, let me talk about some of those issues with lack of diversity. And this ties into um, your first video on the bananas. Okay. So remember I mentioned how bananas in your lifetime, the ones that we're used to, might go extinct. And this has happened before. So in the 60s and 50s, there was a banana. If you've ever eaten like, um, you tasted artificial banana flavoring, it doesn't taste like our bananas. That's because it's based on a past banana. That banana is the Gros Michel banana. Gros Michel, French name. Anyways, so people, the customers, you and I and people in the store, the public demanded seedless bananas. So because these bananas are seedless, I can't use plant sex to make babies, right? I have to rely on clones. I have to continually clone my mother plant, which means every little baby is the exact same as the mom. So there's no genetic diversity. Every time I make a little baby banana, 
to sell to a farmer and a farmer makes more baby of these bananas. He's making clones of the exact same plant and there's no diversity. It's the same genes everywhere. So that's the case now too. Our current banana, which is called a Cavendish, C-A-V-E-N-D-I-S-H, Cavendish, is seedless and is propagated by clones. They're all the same. So whether you're growing, you're getting your bananas from Hawaii, Costa Rica, Mexico, wherever, all the Cavendishes are the same. And this is a problem. There's no diversity in the genetics. So there's a disease, Panama disease. You'll see this in the video too. And there's some questions that is really good at killing this banana now. And that's a big deal because of this disease gets out, it can kill all of the bananas and they're all the same, right? All the bananas we get at the store, the seedless ones that we're used to, are dwarf Cavendish. And those will all be gone. And then the breeders will be stuck trying to figure out a new banana. Now there's still Gros Michel, which was the banana that was before that was also destroyed. There's still people that have that. And Cavendish will survive too, but its fate is in large-scale agriculture will be terminated because this disease, which is hard to manage, will just be too effective at killing it. And there'll just be these collections from people that have plants growing in greenhouses in very specific growing conditions and protect it. Those will survive, but as a crop large scale it will not so you'll watch a video on that i think that's video one of the first videos on your uh, list you have four and this video is to illustrate the fact that you need diversity this is why we save seeds in a seed collections right this is a big deal because without this diversity, if something comes along like a, a disease, we don't have the plant material to breed back to. That's one big reason why we keep seeds of all sorts of plants. Like we collect them in a bank. The other one is what happens if like they get like a war or something and they get become rare. We need we have to collect them because just in case the possibility that they might become, you know extinct but another big one is for diseases just like the pandemic with us plants are getting diseases all the time all sorts of diseases come in from different places and affect our plants so again genetic variation the ability to change color the ability to uh, do different things to adapt to their plant surroundings increase the plants uh, ability to survive Remember, they can't move. So they really, really, really need um, to rely on that for sure. All right. So the other interesting thing we got to talk about on your in your PowerPoint. So if we go to your next slide. Is the genotype and the phenotype. And then I'll talk about Mendelian genetics. So kind of ignore the pelic, the little birds with the little A's right now. We'll talk about them in a, little, in a second. Mm -hmm. Those are going to come in. When we talk about Mendelian mm -hmm. genetics, I will use those little birds and little letters as an example. Hold on one second. But right now, just kind of put them to the side. All right, the fe the genotype, genotype. That's the actual genetic makeup of an organism. So your genotype would be your unique DNA sequence, right? Every person has a DNA sequence that's unique to them. So that's your genotype. That's like all of your genes, everything that makes you up. Right? And only you have one that makes up you. OK? 
Okay, so it's a very like unique um, recipe. We all get a unique one. All plants, all animals, every individual organism gets a new one. Or gets its own, excuse me. And that's the genotype. And that's all of the genes you've inherited over time. So it's a lot of information. A lot of adaptations. A lot of adaptations that your ancestors have made to various things in your environment. Okay, your phenotype. The phenotype is what you look like, how you act. It's how those genes, your genotype, it's how all those genes come together to make the plant and you look and act and function the way it does. Because not every plant, if you took the seeds of a pod and you planted those seeds in different places, those plants are going to do different things based on the climates in those different places. But they all have the same, or not same, but a similar genotype. They all have the same genetic um, makeup, the genetic toolbox, if you will, the same inherited um, traits to, ha to handle different things. They all have those, but, right, the phenotypes can express differently. Plants in hot, dry, can have smaller leaves than the plants in the cooler and wet. They'll have bigger leaves to get more sun, right? These plants, they need to be able to do this change because once they sprout, they can't move. So plants are a little bit more morphologically. Remember, morphologically is what we look like outside, the outside. They look very, they can look very different, but still be related because they come from different climates. Animals can do this too, but plants are really good at that. I think that's neat. That makes horticulture kind of fun because some plants look very different in different places. We see this a lot in food. So you may have heard of like Maui onions or Vidalia onions or Texas sweet onions. They're all the same type of onion. And you can grow the same onion too. It's a sweet onion, Texas sweet granix. But when you grow these onions in different soils, um, soil types, they taste different. So, for example, like Maui onions and Vidalia onions, Vidalia is in Georgia, Maui's in Hawaii, they taste very sweet but very kind of different because of the different soils they're growing on. So that would be a change in the phenotype, how those genetics are expressed right? Maybe a variety of plant from the desert, the leaves are covered with hair and a little gray hair to protect them from the really intense sunlight because the gray hair will reflect excess heat and excess light. The normal, the plants from the, the normal climate will have like a regular green leaf. So what you see is a phenotype difference. The green leaf, that's the phenotype from the normal wet areas. And the silver leaf, that's the phenotype from the dry areas. Typically, the same genes are in the gene in the other one too, but they're not expressed. So again, the phenotype is what we're looking at. What do you look like? How do the genes that you got from your mom and your dad, how are they put together and how are they expressed? Right? This is, and this is, very important with plants because they are can be very different in their phenotype their phenotypes excuse me right so and that's important to plant breeders because you're going to get diversity and you might accidentally find something new that you didn't know you had or you might find the solution to what you're breeding for hopefully that's what happens so again that's why we want the diversity. So genotype is all the genes. And phenotype is what's expressed. So let's get to what those little birds in the letters say. So in Mendel, Mendel, he's the scientist, old guy, with peas, kind of figured out basic genetics. Mendelian genetics. 
And I'll explain that first before we go into the birds and the big A little A and all that stuff. So it's pretty simple. Mendelian genetics says that there are dominant and recessive traits. And every organism has a combination of these dominant and recessive traits. So a good example is eye color. So brown eyes are dominant. Blue eyes are recessive, but just because you have brown eyes doesn't mean you don't have the genes for blue eyes. So, for example, if you have an ancestor with blue eyes, you'll have those genes within you, but they'll be recessive because more likely the brown eyes will uh, be expressed in your phenotype, right? Your genotype might include those blue eyes, but your genotype, sorry, your phenotype expressions be brown eyes because they're dominant. People who have blue eyes have blue eyes because they inherited two sets of recessive blues. They don't have any brown eye genes to take over. They only have blue eye genes, which means that their parents had blue eyes or similar. So Mendelian genetics is very simple. You want a flower, that you have a plant that has blue flowers, you have, sorry, white flowers, stick with white and red, and you have a plant with red flowers. Your goal is pink, which is a what? A cross between the white and the red. So you're going to cross them together. Now, when you do that, let's say that red is dominant and white is recessive. You're going to want to make something called a Punnett square. We'll do this on Monday. Uh, which is just a little chart, four chart, and you can put, you're looking for red, so let's use R. So big R is dominant, right, for red, feather, for red flowers. So if a, you're going to put R, R at the top. You have your little square divided into four smaller squares. And you're going to put RR at the top, just outside of that square. That's your red flowering plant. Now, on the opposites, on this side of the graph, where you have the four quarters, you're going to put the white flower. And that's going to be little r, little r. Little red, little red. And little r, little r makes white. Those are recessive. So the combinations you can get in your graph now that has four quadrants, you can have big R, big R, which is going to be red, right? You could have combinations that are going to be pink, right? Half and half. And then you're also going to have some combinations in there that are going to have the little r, the little r, the recessive traits, and they're going to still stay white. Right, so Mendelian genetics means you're gonna you breed them together and you're gonna get various combinations based on those genes. And we use math and we're gonna do that in lab because I wanna show you how to do the graph. It's kind of hard to do it on YouTube, the Punnett square on how we get that done. But basically you get variations and it's about what's dominant and recessive in the genotype, right? And the dominant genes get expressed in the phenotype, what we see. And remember, people can affect this with breeding. We'll talk about that a little bit. They can affect it with breeding on the outcome, basically. We'll get to that in a bit. By the way, we're almost put about 25 minutes. I'll stop the video at about an hour and then, or about an hour or 45 minutes, and then we'll start up again. That way you can take a break. You know, it's not such a long video stream. We'll see how this goes. All right, continuing on. So again, the genotype, your all the genes in there. Your phenotype is what ex, what is expressed. You have dominant and recessive genes, and just like I said, even though you have brown eyes, doesn't mean you might have the genes in there for blue eyes. They're just not expressed. Because remember, if you have brown eye, if you inherited any brown eye ge uh, genes. Those are going to be dominant over the blue-eyed genes. 
That's kind of the basic with Mendelian genetics. And again, we'll go over, we'll make a Punnett square in class, and we'll go over that in class because it just makes more sense. It will complicate it. You might have questions, and I want to show the math behind it. Back to the PowerPoint. So we were on, so that's kind of slide five and slide six. I kind of explained slide five, and then slide six kind of shows the eye color thing that we were talking about. All right, let's go over to slide seven. And slide seven is talking about epigenetics. Uh, oh, you know what? I need to go back. Sorry about that. Let's go back. There's two things I missed in Mendelian genetics. There's kind of like two rules in Mendel's genetics, the classical genetics. There's two laws. And they might help make sense. Too. I, might, I should explain them and at least let you know what they are. And that might help you figure things out. This is back to Mendelian genetics. Sorry about that. So back to Mendelian genetics, there's two laws. One is um, that the law of separation, let's say... Your genetics, what genetics you inherit, is like a coin toss. It could be heads or tails, 50-50. So when something is 50-50, it automatically is what? Divided. You're either going to get the traits for blue eyes or you're not. So there's this law that traits automatically divide and kind of become their own thing because you either do or you don't. You have this 50-50 all the time. Yes or no, and that's how lineages get branched out, the origin of some of these lineages. All right, the law of separation by chance, by this 50-50 chance, yes or no, that's what determines you got the genes. The second law in Mendelian genetics is um, you can only do this with traits that don't affect each other. This is interesting. So, for example, let's talk about uh, Dalmatians. So the color trait, that white coat with black dots, that coloration, whatever the genetics is to make that color happen on the dog, also makes the Dalmatians prone to being deaf. No hearing. Those two traits kind of go hand in hand. So we have to understand that some traits go with others, like red hair and freckles, for example. Or with chickens, this is kind of funny, chickens that don't have tail feathers, there are lots of chickens that don't have tail feathers, they might have blue eggs, and yes, there's chickens with blue eggs. I like chickens, so we're going to talk about that. All right, so there's these different traits that go along, right, for two traits. So we have to know that some traits are individual, and others go together. There's like pairs. Okay, so let me go back to what we were talking about. Sorry about that um, digression. Let's go back to slide seven on the PowerPoint. And also, by the way, if you ever have any questions, just send it to me in the inbox, like in the Canvas inbox. Say, hey, you know, I had a question. Don't put the question here on YouTube. <laughs> I know you normally would. But for class sake, just send it to me in the canvas. And we'll deal with that that way. Or text me or something. But if you text me, give me your name and now I know who's talking to me. Or email me, whatever you want to do. But just don't do it here on, on the YouTube. All right, back to that. So slide seven is epigenetics. So epi means like above or on, above. And genetics is genetics. So epigenetics is like the study of science of what turns those genes on and off. Right? We talked about that genotype. All those genes in your in your genetic code, they're not all expressed. Right? Only certain ones are. So we were like, that's what turns things on and off. Very interesting study. It used to be like, you know, your genotype is all about that and that's what you're, you're born with this set of 
genes and that's what you got. And that's not really what happens. So it's like you're given this toolbox, but the environment turns certain ones on and off, on and off, on and off. Right, we see this a lot, like if you don't exercise, you're gonna get health problems based on not, you know, certain meth, you know, methodologies, certain not methodologies, excuse me. Like if um let me give you an example. So imagine you had a twin, an identical twin, and your identical twin, their adopted family, they were farmers and they, they had to grow all their own food. And they lived in a little island in the middle of nowhere. So they didn't grow up in the United States. They never had health care, you know, medical care. They had to do everything themselves. If we took that twin who grew up on that island, self-sufficient, with no medical care, there's going to be a couple differences between him and you. One, he's probably going to be in better shape and might be uh, healthier in the respect nutritionally because you're eating more junk food. He has to work, they, him or her, they have to work to make their own food and the food they're planting is fairly good, right? When you, if you were to imagine if you had to grow all your food, if you're able to do it, it's more nutritious than buying it. You eat less junk, but it's harder work. So you'd be in better shape, but your twin would have, you know, other health issues like dental long-term issues that you would probably wouldn't have because you were able to, have access to health care. So let's say, you know, dental care is a big one, terrible teeth. Let's say your twin smoked for the rest of Hall's life. That's going to be different. They're going to look different and have different health attributes, similar because you have the same genetics, so things will be similar, but certain things will be different because certain genes are turned on and off, right? You may be bigger, not, I'm not saying fatter, but you may be physically taller and just bigger person because you grew up in the United States with adequate nutrition, you can get bigger. Your twin didn't, your twin's smaller because you can't, your body can't grow as a child if you have diminished nutrition. So there's these epigenetics which affect the um, phenotype. And with plants, remember, they don't move. So they can kind of change the way they grow depending on the conditions in the environment, which is really neat. Because as a farmer, let's say you're looking for a plant that's more drought tolerant, heat tolerant, you might find one by accident in your field. And you're like, oh, that plant looks very, you know, compact, you know, and you try out, you try that one and you find out it does really good in the heat and in the drought. That's the one you collect seeds from. Likewise, you have a tomato and you, every year your tomatoes, you know, you get disease, which is very common on tomatoes and the disease wipes out your tomatoes. But this one time, this one plant is just like, it didn't get the disease. So you take the seeds from that one and you plant those every year. And every year, the ones that don't get the disease, you keep the seeds from. So in a sense, that's what how breeding start, right? By recognizing that plants can adapt and change, there's a phenotype, right? A plant phenotype to different uh, situations, and people are like, "Oh, you know, this is this makes sense now. Those plants look different because they're adapting to this climatic or this particular area. And why don't we use those? <laughs> if I'm in that area, let's take those seeds and plant them in my garden." and see what happens, and it usually works. And you can also make your own phenotype. If you, after like, you know, five, 10 years, keep on collecting seeds from plants, like I give you a tomato plant, and you only grow the, that, that, the seeds from that tomato plant, so it grew in your yard and you have to, you know, collect the seeds and the next year you plant them and they never buy any more tomato seeds, you just grow that one. Over time, the tomatoes that you're growing are going to adapt to your particular garden, your garden style, your climate, right? And that's normal. That happens all the time. And that's how plants adapt. It does take time. It's not going to happen right away. That's why I said like five, 10 years. But 
it does happen. And actually, I would say maybe even a little faster than animals because plants, again, they can't move. So they need to be able to do this fairly quickly. Um, this adjustment of, you know, of their morphology, not the inside. The anatomy is the same. It's the morphology, like the leaf size, leaf color, leaf texture, stuff like that. How tall the plants get. That stuff changes in response to the environment. Right. Which is pretty cool. And remember, that's all because it's in the it's in the toolbox, the genetic toolbox. That phenotype, the way those plants look and how they're adapting to the environment, that is from the genotype, which is all the genetic traits that were inherited over time. So that's pretty cool, right? So epigenetics is neat. Just remember that. So it's not just like, okay, one plus one equals two. There can be some additional things in there that it's like two something <laughs> because it's also being, I know the environment changes it. It's not just a boom, boom, boom. You know, there's variation. That's what nature wants. Not only is there going to be a lot of variation in genetics, but variation in phenotypes and, and adaptation strategies. And successful plants are highly adaptable, so they have a lot of strategies. And they have different phenotypes. All right, let's go to slide eight. So a naturally occurring variety is a variant of a plant that's found in nature. It's all it is. So you might have many different variations of the same plant in nature. That's a natural occurring variety. So there's genetic variation within nature. So you look at roses, you're like, I want a white rose. Well, there's probably a white rose that's normally naturally found, a naturally found variety of white rose that you're looking for. So that's pretty cool. So a lot of times plant breeders, um, uh, vegetable growers, we look for naturally occurring varieties because they have really good genetics, right? If nature makes something, it's going to be fairly uh, strong. It's going to be very uh, old lineage, typically, um, and fairly stable. Uh, stable meaning like that change that one individual change that genetic individuals uh, traits are fairly stable because we'll learn a little bit that just because something has changed the phenotype has changed doesn't mean it always stays that way it's very unstable and can change but usually a naturally occurring variant is fairly stable genetically because it's old and nature has had time to do it. It's not man-made. So that's pretty cool about them. Um, not always what we are looking for. When I say that, I mean the traits that nature select for are not always the same traits that we select for. But... <laughs> Just because, likewise, nature has built in disease resistance, climate resistance, things that we haven't really figured out how to breed for. So a lot of times we look at these naturally occurring varieties and we're like, wow, that particular wild plant doesn't get any of the disease. Let's take it and breed it with our cultivated plants, the ones we normally grow, which always die. And then we might get something that tastes good, but and is nutritionist, but also is disease resistant. Again, that's what they're doing with the banana. Right now they have something that looks good, tastes good, no seeds, but is really disease susceptible. So they're gonna need to find some genetics that they can bring some disease um, resistance into that. They might lose some of those good genetics though too, but that's part of the game, remember? It's 50-50. It's by chance. You don't know exactly what, you know, what group of, you know, genes you're going to get. It's going to be always a 50-50. All right. So back to the PowerPoint. 
that's naturally occurring varieties again nature if nature makes it it's going to uh, uh, have very good stability and usually the varieties that have adapted to a specific location because of soil type climate type or whatever now when we name a plant we have a specific um, attribute that we put down in their name so if it's a naturally occurring variety we call it a variety and we put it in the name as var period so the abbreviation VAR, that abbreviation is for the word variety, which makes us know it's a naturally occurring variety. So if you want, let's say if you, you have a rose that's normally red, so, ro or sorry, a pink rose, let's go with California wild rose, Rosa Californica. Regular Rosa Californica would be pink. But if there's a population that has naturally occurring albino flowers, they're white, they might name that variety Rosa Californica var, V-A-R period, alba, which means white in Latin. So it'd be Rosa Californica var alba. That V-A-R stands for variety naturally occurring. Pretty cool. All right, let's continue on. Naturally occurring again, nature made it. Let's go to slide nine. Well, let's actually, let's go to slide 10 first, and then we'll talk about slide nine, the picture. So remember, cultivated is nature, did it? Um, the next one, cult, sorry, naturally variety, nature did it. Naturally occurring, nature did it. Variety, B-A-R, naturally occurring. The next one is cultivated variety cultivated variety, we're going to call them cultivar, period. So instead of Rosa Californica var alba, if I read it to be white, it's going to be Rosa Californica CV or cultivar. Carlos is white or whatever I decide to name. So a CV or a cultivar is a man-made variety through breeding. That's all it is. So a cultivar CV is a man-made variety. We see lots of those. Plant breeders make flowers in different colors and they or different patterns and they get different names. And when you breed a plant, when you create a plant, um, you get to name it whatever you want. You know, it's your plant. And there is a plant patenting process. I forget how long it is. I think it's 10 years that there's a plant patent. So you create the genetics. And then every time somebody wants to grow one of your plants, they have to pay you a royalty. So you're not growing all these. So it's like Tommy Hilfinger. He designs, he designs and patents one pair of genes and then multiple factories make them and they sell. He's not making all those genes. Somebody else is making them but they pay him a royalty. That's how he makes his money. So that's pretty cool. So let's go back to the picture, slide nine. So on slide nine, you have these, the, the, bet, the plant you're looking at is a grain. That's um, sorghum from Africa. And it's a feed grain. So it's grown for animal feed. Um, so sorghum grown for animal feed, there's different varieties. So on this slide, you have all the different varieties of sorghum. Okay. But they're split into two groups. On the right-hand side of the slide are the naturally occurring varieties, the VAR period. Those are the varieties that nature made on the right-hand side. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the left-hand side, those are the cultivated varieties, the man-made varieties of the same plant. Everything on that picture is the same thing, just like all the different dogs. But one side that we find in nature and one side that we find in farms, man-made. 
So these would be cultivars and these would be varieties. And it's cool because you look at the man-made side, pretty much you know what man wants. He's got, he needs to eat. So they're all big uh, seed heads. The only thing that really changes on the ones on this side are the color, the texture, taste, and the season of harvest. Color, texture, taste, and season. The ones on the left side, the ones that nature made, they have a lot larger variation in the color and the texture because nature's varieties are designed to survive specific or different places. So you get more variety when nature. That's why I like that picture. It shows how humans are kind of choosing something homogeneous, something similar. There's variety, but it's 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 within a few constraints where nature is all over the place. So I kind of like that slide. It's kind of cool. Again, naturally occurring varieties, nature made them, versus breeds, which are uh, cultivated by Genetically, let's say you find a, you want a white flower and you're given a choice between a cultivated variety with the white flower and a, um, a naturally occurring variety with the white flower. The naturally occurring variety with the white flower could be a better choice because it's more stable or it might be more uh, tolerant to a specific condition that you're looking for. Likewise, the man-made varieties they can be uh, designed for very specific conditions like growing. For example, there's cucumbers that are designed just for inside greenhouses. Even if you have a, a fantastic climate, don't really do good outside because they're bred for a greenhouse. Or lettuce that's hydroponic, which means it's lettuce that's designed to grow in water. Instead of it growing in soil, it's growing in water. Things like that. So there's benefits to both. But man-made varieties are going to have man-made interest in them. Naturally occurring varieties are going to have natural interest. They're, they're different because of natural reasons. That's all. So they're, they're both good or bad. And as a plant breeder, you're going to use both genetics to make new plants. Right. So that's pretty cool. So again, explain kind of slide 10. Uh, let's talk about slide 11. I love this slide. So in the, you'll see all the different vegetables, and then you'll see in the middle it says um, Brassica oleracea. So Brassica oleracea that's regular mustard, good old-fashioned mustard plant. Now, you know the mustard you use in your, on your hot dog. That's the seeds ground up into a paste. But the mustard plant looks like that, the one in the middle. Okay, so Brassica oleracea. So a long time ago, different people got a hold of that plant and started breeding it and turning it into different things based on what they liked. So some people got some seeds of Brassica oleracea, mustard seeds, and they started breeding them. You know, they liked eating the flowers. By the way, I love mustard flowers. So they're like, oh, yeah, this is good. And they keep on breeding for bigger and bigger flowers. Right? They like the flower buds right before the open, the green buds. They're really good. So they keep on breeding. They only, they only cross... The mom and the dad, the mom has big flowers, the dad has to have big flowers. And they keep on doing that over and over again. Big flowers, big flowers. And eventually they change that mustard into broccoli. Right? Big flower buds. Now, broccoli and the mustard are the same plant. Just like a Great Dane and a Chihuahua are the same thing. They're two what? They're a cultivar, right? The broccoli, which was the, the wild mustard, had little teeny flowers. And over breeding, people kept on 
crossing the ones with bigger and bigger flowers and eventually we get giant flowers. That process of breeding creates a cultivar. Even though, so cultivar, broccoli is a cultivar of the mustard. They're still the same thing. All right, another person. They got seeds of, of mustard a long time ago, but they like the buds, the little leaf buds. Not the flowers, not the leaves, not the stems. They like the buds that form on the side, which are kind of good. They're very nutrient dense. So they keep on breeding those forever, and then they end up with Brussels sprouts, right? You know Brussels sprouts, those little cabbages? Those are buds. They form on the side of a stem. They're the exact same thing as broccoli. So broccoli... Brussels sprouts and mustard, same plant. Another person, they're like, they start growing mustard a long time ago. They don't like the leaves. They don't like the, sorry, they don't like the flowers. They don't eat the leaves. They're eat, sorry, I cut this wrong. They don't eat the buds and they're not eating the flowers. They're after the leaves. They like the leaves. So they keep breeding plants with big leaves and, and they, they end up with kale, right? So their cultivated variety is kale, which is the same as broccoli, which is the same as Brussels sprouts, which is the same as mustard. And lastly, another person, they get a hold of seeds of, of mustard, but they like the stems. So they grow for big, juicy stems. And eventually they get a kohlrabi. If you've never seen a kohlrabi, look it up on Google Images. It's kind of looked like a spudnik, a weird alien thing. It's it, What it is, it's a mustard with a, 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 a swollen stem. You eat the stem. But a kohlrabi is the same thing as a broccoli, as the same thing as a kale, as the same thing as a Brussels sprout, as the same thing as the mustard. So all of those are different cultivated varieties of the same plant made by people. Nature didn't make those. That was made by people. Right? Uh, in nature, who knows how many different types of wild mustard there might be? I don't know. There might be all sorts. There might not be any. The wild mustard might be perfect, and it's just people that have... Um, bred it into all these different cultivated varieties. And again, you're looking at phenotypes, all those different things, right? Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, those are different expressions. Those are different phenotypes, which are different expressions of the genotype. But in this case, those were created by man because of um, using selective breeding to make a cultivated variety. So that's kind of how plant breeding works. Simply. There's a lot more to it, but in a simple nutshell, that's kind of how that works. All right, let's talk about some more things in genetics, which are important. We have GMO, so a genetically modified organism is an organism that's man-made, but differently. We didn't use sex to do it. So when we breed different varieties, we use sex to get the mixes we're looking for. But, right, 50% from the mom, 50% from the dad, and it's done naturally. But in a GMO, it's completely man-made. We're selecting the genetics or we're not, not like that, or we're taking a certain genes from one parent and putting it in the other organism. So there's no sex happening. So we're kind of physically moving the genes around. Right? The, the organisms aren't freely breeding. Even, when in, even in human selection, you know, we're still 
you know, bringing the pollen from one plant to the other, even if you're doing it, you know, that's different than GMO where you're actually, let's say, taking a certain gene physically from usually an unrelated plant and putting it in a different plant. So they're man-made plants. And there's a lot of, um, you know, talk about GMOs, good or bad. Now, they are both good and bad. <laughs> they're good because they're able, they allow us, excuse me, to create plants that we're trying to design without the time that we require for all the breeding. So imagine like trying to breed corn or rice to use less water so more people could grow it. Traditional breeding, that might take forever, but with GMO, it's pretty, it's pretty much already happened. They're able to shorten that span because they know exactly which genes to go, go, go get and put in the plant. Let's say you want to use less pesticides. You might GMO a plant to produce a poison that kills the bugs. Well, that's kind of iffy, but that's okay. You know, it's okay if, in the respect that it uses less um, pesticides. So, GMO is inherently not bad. It's it's basically like everything that people do. It's how we use it. We and if we do it wrong, we we mess it up. For example, a lot of times GMO. We use GMO plants to make more money, to increase profit, right? We might make a plant GMO resistant to Roundup, which is a, a herbicide. So the plant itself doesn't get killed by Roundup so that we can spray a whole field of this corn let's or wheat, let's say. We spray whole fields up of, of wheat with Roundup to kill the weeds, but the plant's fine. That might may or not be a good thing. Because, yeah, it's good for the profit, but not really good for the environment. So the GMO basically is the mod it's the motive. Just like with a lot of science and technology, the motive behind the um, technology and how it's used is, is what we should be paying attention to, not the technology itself. It's already been proven to be good technology. With plants, it's really interesting. They, they're they um, they're good um, model organisms because you can get the, you can see the DNA pretty uh, easily in a plant. Um, and in plants, it's also fairly easy to move DNA around. So you can take pieces of plant DNA from one plant genome and put them in the other fairly easy. A little bit easier than with animals. Um, so that's what makes plant uh, uh, plants a lot easier to genetically modify than animals. That, and when we get to later on, the fact that you can clone a plant pretty easily also helps. <laughs> so we'll talk about that later. So again, GMO, genetically modified organisms, are created without sex. So they're, they're mixing... Um, Genes. Now, GMOs might be bad in this respect. Um, let's say, this is just kind of talking in theoretical um, realms, we made a glow-in-the-dark tomato. And to make a glow-in-the-dark tomato, we used a jellyfish that, you know, that lived way deep down in the ocean that glows in the dark. We used a gene from that jellyfish, and we put it in the tomato to make the tomato glow-in-the-dark for giggles, just because. And you eat that tomato, and, and let's say you might have some sort of reaction to those um, compounds made from the jellyfish. This is possible, because you normally would never have come in contact with that jellyfish deep down, and now it's in a tomato, and you have it. That's possible, but I don't know they haven't heard of it being a huge issue lately. Um, the bigger issues has been in the motives of the GMO, how they're designing these things, mostly from a profit standpoint. And generally, GMO, like for example, as a gardener, 
when I worked in the nursery, people would always come in. Are these GMO seeds? Nope, we don't sell GMO seeds. You, it would be, it's very difficult for you, for anybody, to get a hold of GMO seeds. They're only available to farmers, really, large scale. Now you're eating GMO food all the time because it's in the food that is coming from these giant farms. But the GMO is really only used in the uh, mass ag industry. It's not something that you're going to get in a seed catalog. In fact, opposites can occur. You're going to get more of the next type of seeds we're going to talk about than those seeds. So I'm going to round finish up this part of the um, of the uh, lecture, and then we're going to start take a break. I'll take a break, and then I'm going to have part two. And that's going to talk about um, heirlooms, open pollinated, and then your homework stuff. So I'll stop now. And then again, part two is coming up.